love for us together. All right, welcome, and I invite you to stand. We'll begin with a call to worship. of truth. God has promised. God remembers. God is faithful. Let's begin our songs together forever.
is to come forward. Come on up. Come on up. There's not a ton of us, so we're just going to hang out together. And I'm going to ask you an, a question that's an easy question, but it's also a hard question. Come over here, guys. Come over here so I can look you in the eye and make sure you're listening. Come on over. Come on. Come on. I haven't bitten anybody like in the last week or two. Here's the question. Ready? What is an office? You guys know what an office is? Yeah, go ahead. What's an office? Come on up, come on up, come on up. Here's the question. The question is, what's an office? Yeah, go ahead. It's a place where a specific person works. That's a very good answer. Yes. Right, like a home office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's another definition of the word office. So when you say like a politician runs for an office, do you think he's trying to get elected to, to be in a building or, or in an office space? No, right? So an office also means a position. It means a calling. And so <clears throat> um, there, it, it's a... It's a it's, it's something that they fulfill by who they are. So who is Jesus? Do you, can you guys think of some offices that Jesus fulfills? And not like a physical building, but like some of the things that he is. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, that's a description, but it's not really an office. So what I mean is like, yeah, go ahead. That's closer. That's a lot closer. So, so we say officially that there are three different... Oh, sorry, he said shepherd, which is a pretty good answer. So there are three official um, offices that Jesus holds, and they are prophet. You guys know what a prophet is? Someone who speaks God's word to the people, so that makes sense. And priest, someone who takes, helps people take care of their sins, and then, and then king. That Jesus is the prophet, he's the priest, and he's the king, all at the same time. He holds those specific offices. And the reason I bring this up, oops, I'm really kind of tangling here, is that today is a particular Sunday. The Sunday always before Advent is Christ the King Sunday. And so we remember that Jesus is the King. Do you guys know what it's like to live under a king? No. Do we have a king in America? I can't remember. No. No. What do, what do we have again? President. president. Right, right. And how does he become president? Is that because you know, his, his ancestors were, were presidents? No, no, no. Oh, gosh, that's kings, isn't it? That's kings. Yeah. So you vote, right? So, so we live in a democracy. So when we remember that Jesus is the king, that he is in charge, he has always been in charge, his word is law, everything he does is, is exactly right because he's the king. And one of the reasons, or rather, one of the things that we do to show that, that to be reminded that Jesus is the king, um, is that kings back then wore purple. Purple was a very expensive dye. And the reason why is they had these little, they would get the dye from these little tiny snails in the Mediterranean, and they'd smash them all up, and then they'd run the thread through that, whatever was there, and, and it would turn it purple. So it was really expensive. Can you see anything purple that I'm using to remind us that it's Christ the Quint King Sunday? Yes. <gasps> yes, my shirt is pur has some purple in it. What else has some purple in it today, do you think, that you can look around and see? Uh, no? <laughs> oh, yeah, look at that. There's some purple over there on the, on the communion table. So it's just to, to be reminded that, that Christ is the king. And even though he comes as a baby... He is still the king. He was the king when he was a baby. He was a king before he, was, before he came to us. He's the king after. He's the king now. So don't ever forget, okay, that Jesus is the king, and he holds, that's one of the three offices that he holds. Yes, little girl, that I don't um, know. The babies, when they were tiny, if the baby is cooking, when the, when the, when the baby cries and it has to go. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's a good biology lesson about babies kicking in the stomach. So, so if you're interested, that's what we were talking about. Um, let me pray for us, and we'll get you guys going.
Jesus, thanks for today. Thanks for being our king and allowing us to be part of your kingdom. Uh, I ask that you bless these kids, that you, they, would, they would know you better more and more every day, that you would uh, come alive to them and to us in, in every way. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys are dismissed, I think. You're heading out. Oh, won't we go that? morning. I'm Brian Silker, Elder of Finance here at Union Church, and I want to welcome you all this morning. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. We have, uh, the first thing I'd like to talk about is we have a connect card in the pews, and we'd like to have all of you fill that out. It's working. Okay. Great. And so the, this card is a great way for us to know you are here and how we could help you get connected with various church ministries. So you could submit a prayer requests or requests to be added to the weekly email. And uh, you can also contact us online if you don't fill out one of those cards at unionpc.org and click on the connect with us image. You're invited to come help us decorate the church uh, for the Advent and Christmas season on Friday, next Friday, December 1st, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., and if needed, on Saturday, December 2nd, also at 9 a.m. We'll be organizing and hanging the Christmas greenery and decorations, and so this is a great way to get started with the Christmas spirit and have some fun. There's a Help One Child Giving Tree out in Bailey Hall, and uh, we'd ask you to consider donating a new toy or gift for a local foster or adopted child. So you can sign up at the Help One Child Giving Tree display table just uh, through the doors there. You can pick up an instruction card for gifts for children of different ages, and we ask that you bring those unwrapped gifts before or on uh, Sunday, December 3rd. We're sad to announce that Barbara Billings has passed away. She was a longtime union member, and she was called home to be with our Lord. She passed away on the morning of November 18th uh, of this year, and we'll let you know the details of her memorial service as soon as they're available. Let's bow our heads for a moment of silence. Amen. Our memory verse for this month, for November, is Ephesians 5, 19 through 20. So let's say that together. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. At this time, we invite the adult choir to come forward to prepare for their offering song. As part of worship, we continue to give back to God out of the blessings he has given us. During the offering music, we invite the ushers to come forward and pass the plates to collect the offering. And other ways to give are by mailing your check to the church or you can give online at union pc.org slash give.
No, we've been collecting food for the past couple of weeks, and so we're going to bless that and also um, pray a prayer of thanksgiving. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful um, that you know us, that you love us, that you have blessed us with yourself and with more blessings than, than we can possibly ever count. And we are grateful to be able to share with others so we ask, Lord, that the food that has been collected would be going to the right people who, who truly need it and will be blessed by it. Um, Lord, you talked to Abraham and you said that you were going to bless him in order to be a blessing to everybody else. And I ask that, that, that we would be the same way. And we truly have been blessed. Now the question is if we're going to be a blessing to everybody else. And so I ask, Lord, that you would prompt us in that direction, give us a a push and a kick if necessary, Lord, that, that we would bless others because we have been so blessed by you, your presence, by Christ and the cross. We are blessed. Um, help us to recognize that and to, to seek to bless others um, because of who you are. 
we are grateful, Lord, for, their, for this place and, and for your love. Help us, Lord, to live in it. We pray this always in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The Old Testament reading comes today from Psalm 119, 65 to 72. It says this, Do good to your servant according to your word, Lord. Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I trust your commands. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. Though the arrogant have smeared me with lies, I keep your precepts with all my heart. Their hearts are callous and unfeeling, but I delight in your law. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. All right. So we are still in Ephesians, and next week we're going to start in Advent, but we're not there quite yet. Um, I appreciate knowledge. I, I, I come from a very knowledgeable, knowledge, pro-knowledge family. Uh, my dad taught college, so he had a, a Ph.D. Uh, my mom was a, a teacher for a long time, and she got a master's degree in teaching and then became a minister and and got a master's degree in that. Um, so, knowledge was always important in, in our family. But it was nothing compared to, I read a story one time about a guy who had um, gotten out of the Vietnam War, and as part of the, the deal that he had with the government, they said that they would, he, they would pay for him to go to school. And so what he did was he went to school, and he never stopped. He never stopped his whole life. He ended up with like six or seven PhDs, um, all sorts of master's degrees. He just never stopped going to school. Um, never worked a job, really. Just went to school his entire life. And the problem, of course, is that knowledge is supposed to be a means to an end. At least that's what my practical nature says, that you know, it's generally, I think, good to be well-educated, but simply to be educated, to sit around and glory in how educated we are, that doesn't seem to be a good idea. Because a lot of time and energy and money goes into educating someone in order to put that knowledge to use. Now, God gives us a lot of things, spiritual gifts, promises, and other things, in order that they be used, not just possessed. And, and what I mean used, I mean used in the day-to-day, -day, not saved up for when we finally meet God. The knowledge of how much God loves us should impact us each and every day. And so we're looking at this prayer that Paul has at the end of the first chapter of Ephesians. He says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Let me pray for us. Lord, this is your word um, given through Paul to the Ephesians and to us. And so I ask that you would uh, take it and not just bury it in our heart, Lord, but you would put it deep in our, in our souls, but also build on it, that we would use it, that we would live in it, that this would be who we are. Um, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So to summarize, Ephesians, as we go into Advent next week, 
we are adopted by God who becomes our father. He has a kingdom, and we, becomes, we become citizens in that kingdom. And then he gives us an inheritance of glory and gives us a deposit on that inheritance, the Holy Spirit. And then having said all that, Paul goes into a prayer, not for himself, but for the Ephesians. And what he repeats in the prayer is, I pray that you would know. Now, <clears throat> it should be said, Paul is not praying for knowledge and power, but rather that the people would have knowledge of the power. Basically, having explained the incomparable riches of what God has blessed us with in Christ, that we would know or have deep spiritual knowledge of it. The image I was given was of someone wading in, into the shallow sea of, of truth. And, and we just can't stay in the shallows, but we have to go out into the deep sea and swim in the love of God. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's helpful to think of our position in this way so that we never think that we've learned everything that there is to know about God, that and, and then somehow we stop striving to learn and to put into practice the, the gifts of God. But, but in the face of difficulties and struggles, we need to know that we have barely started to draw on the depth and power of God's love that's available to us. So Paul says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, which literally means I pray your heart would be sensitive to the light of what God has done for you. Paul doesn't pray for them to be adopted. They already are. He doesn't pray for power or for glory or for inheritance. They already have those things. He prays that the Ephesians would know them. Now, the word know in the Bible can be used in some interesting ways. I remember as a young man reading the Bible and um, some of the Old Testament stories that said that so-and-so knew a woman, and she bore him a child. And I thought for a long time, boy, I, I really can't get to know any of the girls at school. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to become a dad, and I'm much too young for that. But later on, I learned that the Hebrew word yada not only means information, but it means a personal encounter. So Paul prays that they would have a personal encounter, that they are called by him, that they would have power. Uh, can you switch the slide? Is it, there's a, a next one? Ah, there we go. Thank you. <clears throat> and I think that most Christians know this, but it's, they know it in their head. They don't know it in their heart. Um, it, it isn't practical. It isn't everyday knowledge for us. I mean, I wonder if most of our issues, if most of our struggles or problems are caused mainly by, by the fact that I don't really know what I think I know. I know that God loves me, but I don't know it with my heart. I know that God has a place for me in eternity and that everything is ultimately okay, and I know that in my head, but do I know that with my heart? I mean, are we mad that God hasn't given us everything already of what we need? Chapter 4 in Romans is exactly this, and it uses Abraham as an example. And you remember the big thing in Abraham's life was that he didn't have an heir. And then God came to him and said, you're going to have a son when both he and Sarah were older than I am, uh, and probably you. And Abraham believed that God had the power to fulfill that promise, and so he gave God glory <coughs> and was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. So Abraham starts off with information. He starts off with head knowledge. God told him he would have a son, and he knew that God had the power to make that happen. And then he gives God glory, which is, you know, means weighty, that he gives God weight as important or heavy um, and, and, and believed. There is a sense that we can do this as well, that we can meditate on and reflect on God's promises to us, and we can stick them into our, our minds and our hearts over and over until it becomes who we are and what we're about. It must be said, of course, that Abraham fluctuated with time. It took a long time for that promise to be realized, and, and he 
stepped out when he shouldn't have stepped out on occasion, um, but he, he gave God the glory, and eventually that, that promise was fulfilled. You know, we sing a, a hymn occasionally about God taking over our mind and, and us living in, in the, his promises. May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day by his love and power controlling all I do and say. See, the thing is, if we have enough hope, if we understand our, we, if we have enough hope, we understand our calling. If we have enough wealth, we understand our inheritance. If we have enough power, we realize we can do anything in Christ. The problem is we so often don't see it, that our hearts are closed to what God might do. Our eyes are closed to what God might do. And this is a situation, I have to tell you, this is specific to Christians, not just anyone. So let me back up and say, how do we know that we're a Christian? Well, there's two things that are important. One is doctrinal beliefs, and the other is practical character. Each of these qualifications can go sideways, and you've seen that. If doctrinal beliefs don't matter, you'll hear something like, well, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're a good person. And then the flip side, when practical character issues go sideways, you'll hear something like, well, you can be a part of our church as long as you believe in the creeds and our understanding of Scripture, and you sign the statement of faith, and yes, there's a lot of infighting around here, and don't talk to so-and-so and you want, unless you want to get gossiped about, but the good news is we all believe the same stuff. It doesn't work that way. God won't ever say that right doctrine proves you're a follower of Jesus or a compassionate life makes you a Christian. There are lots of sweet folks out there who believe, and a lot of folks who have a knowledge of right doctrine right doctrine, but have zero actions to back it up. Knowledge of God should be a working knowledge, and it should be useful in the day out, day in, day out life of a follower of Jesus. And the reason I bring this up, just to be clear, is that Paul says, for this reason I prayed about you ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus. And then later on he talks about having love for all the saints. Those two things go together. The knowledge of God brings together those two, the doctrine and the love together in this working system. You know, it's funny. Paul could have prayed so much for the Ephesians that they wouldn't suffer persecution. He could have prayed that they would stay mentally healthy and mature, that they would be physically safe and healthy. <coughs> but what he prays for is that they would know God better. And whether you know it or not, that is your life's goal, to know God better. The ba basic purpose of every event in your life and mine is to know God better. Now, we all know that there's two basic types of knowledge. There's book smarts and there's street smarts. And it is absolutely possible to have great book knowledge and to have no spiritual or heart knowledge. See, every problem we have can be analyzed and understood as a failure to internalize what you know in your head to be true about God's, God, about God and God's wisdom. So you know that God is wise, but we don't always trust that God is wise in our specific case. So I'll repeat myself. The main business in your life is knowing God better. This is what Paul says. He says, I pray that you will know what is the hope of his calling? And what is the riches of his glorious inheritance in the state, uh, saints? And what is his incomparably great power? And those are the three things I want to get to today. The main problem is we don't know those things. We may have them in our head, but they don't impact us each day. It's head knowledge, not heart knowledge. So from the Greek, it's, I'm not sure it's a good translation to say the hope of your calling. I think it's better to say the hope of his calling, that God has called us. Now, calling is generally an interruption. You know, when I call out to my girls to get their attention, it, to start doing something they currently aren't, usually it's listening to me. God has called us. He has broken into our lives to get our attention. <coughs> there are var various verses confirming this. <coughs> Pardon me. But one is Galatians 1, 15 to 16. God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was 
pleased to reveal his son in me. So the hope of your calling is the assurance that you have been called. It's the head knowledge and the heart knowledge that you have been called by God to come and follow him. Further, it's the assurance of your salvation, the, that the problem of sin in your life has been solved, and it's in the process of being healed. So the worst issue in your life is being dealt with. All the other issues rank much lower than that. I still think we struggle with God's love. We hear about it a lot, but we sometimes seem like other people really feel and understand and live into God's love for them, and we're still waiting for the light to come on. We want to do something that, that shows that, that we love God and He loves us. Maybe we want to create a specific memory that will always bring us back to the place where we remember that we are God's because we accepted Him, or we went down front to pray during a revival or whatever. And I think Paul would say, that, that's not it. Don't look at what you did in going down to get prayed for. That's not bad, but it's not it either. Paul says, look at Jesus. Even if you're struggling to believe or if you're frustrated because you might not believe, that frustration or struggle has to be the work of God in you. You only think you're struggling because God is working on you from the inside. He's, he's been calling and working. If you want to know if God loves you, don't look at what you've done or a memory that you have created. Look at what God has done. Look at how great grace is and how free it is. Look at how he finds the lost. The hope of our calling is that we're followers of Jesus because he sought after us. But wait, there's more. Remember what I said previously, last week, that you are God's wealth, that you are his portion, his possession. And at the, the time I said, last week, that God looks at us and feels wealthy, that, that God is our portion and we are his portion. We know what is waiting for us at the end of our lives. It's glory. If Ephesians talks about the glorious, the riches of our glorious inheritance. So God's wealth and, and that future is freely shared with us. And this can be understood in a couple of ways. The first thing is, Paul wants you to know deep in your heart that you are a precious jewel in God's sight. In the Old Testament, the Jews were given uh, uh, an actual picture of this. The high priest would wear this breastplate when he went into the Holy of Holies once a year. Can you go to the next slide? There it is. That's, a, that's not an actual picture from 2,000 years ago, um, as you might have guessed. But this is what he would wear. And, and so each precious stone on there would have a, the, the, um, the name of a different tribe um, inscribed right, right near it. And that, that, um, that jewel stood in or emblemized that, that tribe. And so the high priest is taking all of Israel into the Holy of Holies as this, this precious gift. And then God would see the high priest, and he would see all the Israelites as this, these precious things, these precious rocks and, and, and jewels. And, and that really is a picture for us in the Old Testament, but it's also how Jesus does it in, in the New Testament, when he brings us to God, us in his hands. Um, we are God's kids. And, and so Jesus sees a precious jewel in you, over the heart of Christ, that Christ brings us to the Father, and so God sees you as a precious, beautiful object. And if you know this, deep in who you are, it should affect how you live. One of the things we're going to have to address eventually with Lisa and Daisy at some point is the importance of tests. It's important to do well on tests as well as you can, but without turning tests, of course, into an idol of some sort. Knowledge, like I said, is important in our family, but it isn't what saves us. It isn't our security. I want them to, to, to live out, and I want them to know that they are already loved by God. He has already promised to take care of them. They already have an abundance inheritance in God. And, and when they are scared and when they disobey, they, 
like me when I choose to do those things, have forgotten, hopefully temporarily, that we are precious to God. When King David does his thing with Bathsheba, he has forgotten who he is, whose he is, who he is. He has forgotten that he's precious in God's eyes in his quest to do what he wants to do. And then we read in Psalm 51, David remembering who God is and remembering who he is. You know, there's lots of places where Jesus reminds people to depend on God rather than what they can control. One of the ways is, you know, Jesus says, don't invite people over to your house just so you can get an invitation back to theirs. Because if you do that, then you're already going to reap the reward of it. You, you might feel good about being hospitable, but you've already had your reward, you've already had your inheritance, and you won't get a reward from God later. The rewarding's already happened. You know, often if we obey God, it's going to cost us. It'll cost us in self-esteem, like when we don't lash out when we've been attacked. It can cost us in emotional energy when we try to forgive people who have sinned against us, and we bear the cost of forgiveness. It can cost us financially. God calls on his people to tithe 10%, or at least try to work up to that amount. And if that means less dinners out, well, then that's the cost. If it means a less expensive car, then that's what it means. If we follow the Ten Commandments, it might cost us the cool factor among our peers. And I'm only saying that for you all. I've uh, been so, so not cool for so long, I've, I've gotten used to it. I think God looks at the cost we pay to follow him and agrees. He says, yeah, it does cost you something. Don't put your hand, he says, to the plow and then look back. Count the cost, but don't forget God has something for us. He has our inheritance. And it will be worth far more eventually than any cost that we pay in this life. And remember, your sin doesn't negate the inheritance. It cuts off the benefits for a day, for a time, but not for all time. Last thought is this. Listen again. He says that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us, for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ. And there's a missing word here from a lot of English translations, and it's the word kata, which means according to. And the NIV translated it like, and then that translation influences other translations, and we lose the meaning. Paul is saying that we believe according to, that I believe what is in my bank account according to what the banker says. I believe what happens to, to the sea, you know, to the fish in the deep sea according to what people say that study them. So look at the sentence again. That you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is according to the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So faith itself is the miracle. We believe because of what God did through Christ. Paul says the power of God working in us is the same. We saw it already when God raised Christ from the dead. There are many demonstrations of power all around us. I think of the atmospheric rivers from last winter or the fires that thankfully weren't as bad this year. But the scariest power out there for us is the power of death. And we see this in ourselves as we age. Death is the ultimate in enemy. And yet we know that God defeated death through Christ. That physical death has no claim on us anymore as followers of Jesus. As soon as we close our eyes for that final time, we're in the presence of God, more alive than we ever have been. Death should not scare those of us who are precious to God. So the question I have is this, and I'm guessing you already knew this or you're just learning it, but the question is, how should this change your life? How do we take all that head knowledge and make it heart knowledge? Do we remind ourselves of our inheritance on a regular basis so that we can live without cares that weigh us down in the here and now? Can we stop clawing for recognition, for respect, and love 
stop waiting for others to validate our lives? What can you do to hear again and then live into God's great and huge and permanent love for you? Let's pray. Lord, thank you that Paul was praying for the Ephesians that they might live into what they already know. I, I, Lord, would ask that for us as well. That we would know deeper how much you love us and that would affect us every day as as we seek to know you better. As we seek to, to reflect your glory and your hope to the people around us but not just for them, Lord, that we would live in that hope. We would live in the anticipation of who you are for us all the time. And as I think about that, Lord, I think about so many times that I haven't done that, that I have done what I wanted to do because I was tired or frustrated or a little bit bent and broken that I have said things that I wish I could take back. I, I've done things I wish I could undo but can't. So Lord, I, I ask that you would, in this space that we have with you, in the silence, Lord, that you would lead us, remind us that you love us, but also that you want to change us, to be more like the people you created us be, to be. Um, that you would lead us in our confession. Lord, I ask that you would hear our confession. Let's pray. God, it is so intimidating sometimes to know that you know us so thoroughly. There's nothing that is hidden from you, and yet we seek to hide our faces because we're ashamed of, of the things that we have said, the things that we have done, even the things that we've thought sometimes pull us up short and, and make us just shake our heads at our own actions, our own thoughts. So, Lord, we come into your presence again, um, hopefully renewed in our awe and wonder at, at the fact that you know us and that you love us despite who we are, despite what we've done. And all you ask us to do is just come and say it to you, to admit it, and, and, and to be a part of, of willing to, to change led, of course, by the Spirit that you've already put in us as, as a deposit. And so, Lord, we apologize for the things that we have said that hurt others, that cut them deeply, things that didn't need to be said, but we felt free to say them. We apologize for the things that we didn't say, the, the encouragement that we could have given, the compliments, the um, the grace we could have given that we chose to hold on to. We apologize, Lord, for those things. We apologize for the things that we have done that were not who you would have us be, who didn't reflect your glory and your love and the hope that we have in who you are and what you've done for us. And we apologize for the things that we didn't do, the things that we left undone because we were tired or bored or the game was on, whatever. We apologize, Lord, for even our thought lives, for the things that, that when a, a thought came into our, our lives that we didn't just dismiss it, but we, we sat on it for a while. We nursed it and we, we encouraged that, that thought and teased it out when we knew it wasn't from you. And we apologize, Lord, for that ask that you would change our hearts and our lives. We pray all these things, Lord, 
and ask for your grace again to cover us, um, to remind us, Lord, that we are precious in your sight all the time. And there's nothing we can ever do to lose that. But we're just being faithful and doing what you have called us to do and confessing it out. And so, Lord, we have and ask again for your grace to, to renew us, to encourage us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Who taught us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The good news is that in Christ we are forgiven, and that is really good news. Amen. Our closing song this morning, How Great Thou Art, just helps us to reflect on the greatness of God, and I just hope that as we are singing that, that you are living, living out what it means to bask in God's amazing love, his amazing grace for us, and just the awe and wonder of it all, because next week we're getting into the Advent season, and that is such a special time in our Christian calendar and our church season. So I invite us to stand as we continue our worship together. How great thou art.
I'm making a solemn promise to you. There is no leftovers through that door. There's, there's, there's good fellowship, but there's no turkey. Uh, there's no potatoes that are left over. It's all good for, for you. So come and enjoy. So let me send us out with a blessing. Lord, send us out from this place full again uh, of the knowledge of your love for us. You are the king in that still you know us personally. You love us. Help us, Lord, to, to live in and through that knowledge. Because that would affect everything we say and do and our perspective on the world. That you would send us out, Lord, with the, the guidance of the Spirit, the love of the Son, and the power of the Lord God Almighty. And the people of God say, Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs>